This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and it's Saturday. That means it's time for Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic. We're talking about Modern Horizons 3 today because next Friday, or this coming Friday rather, my set review for the new set will begin. We'll have the full card gallery uh, on the 31st at the latest. And we've got the pre-release on June 7th and a release on Arena on June 11th. So we've got a brand new limited format coming our way. And especially if you play on Arena, it's gonna be like the main limited format for most of the summer. In paper, you're less likely to see it because these sets tend to be more expensive than normal ones. So it's actually kind of harder. They're less accessible in paper. But on Arena, you'll be able to play this format a whole bunch and it's not gonna cost any different than a normal draft does. So I'm doing a full set review and everything just like I did for the Lord of the Rings set last year. This is sort of in that same slot. So, uh, as usual, a Modern Horizons set is far more complicated than a normal one. We don't just have like a handful of mechanics appearing on cards. In this case, we have like 40. Uh, however, I'm not gonna go deep on all 40. Many of them are gonna appear on a handful of cards. Instead, I'm going to look at the mechanics that look to be really primary themes uh, in the set, big themes in the set, mechanics that'll come up a lot and are part of archetypes and stuff like that, as opposed to mechanics that are just like on two cards. We're not gonna go deep on those. I'll talk about them in the set review, obviously, because I'll talk about every card in the set. Uh, we'll also talk some about the bonus sheet for this particular set. Um, the bad news is for this particular preview season, we don't have all the info about what the archetypes are. Last time, the last couple of times maybe, by the end of the first week of previews, you know, I had enough info to tell you what the archetypes are gonna be. And I have some idea for some of them, as we'll see in this video, but I don't have all of them. So mostly we're just looking at mechanics today, how I think they'll play. And none of them are um, new mechanics, they're all returning ones. And But there are a lot of really nice, graded, greatest hit ones. So let's dive in to talk about mechanics. And I wanna talk about the one that I'm the most excited for. And that is that we have modal double-faced lands back in the mix. So in general, modal double face cards are different than your typical double face cards because instead of having to play it on one side and then doing something to get it to transform, with modal double face cards you have, as the name would imply, two modes. You can choose to play one side or the other. And modal double face lands are particularly interesting because, I mean, they just tend to be great for limited. We've really only seen them once in Zendikar Rising. Is that what that set was called? The recent Zendikar set? Um, and they're awesome. I mean, let's look at Legion leadership here, uh, which is one generic and a red-white hybrid mana. It's an instant, until end of turn, double target creature's power and it gains first strike. That's kind of a medium trick. Um, sometimes it can really get your opponent. It's definitely a playable card already, but what makes it really great is the other side's a land, okay? And it's not just any land, it's a dual land in this particular case. It can add one mana of two different colors, red or white in this situation. So, uh, what's great about this is that there are a lot of times in games where you wish a card in your hand was a land or you wish a card in your hand wasn't a land. With these cards, you can get away with running like 13 cards that are always land, sometimes less if you have enough of them. And then you have these cards that actually do something in the late game when you draw them other than be lands. And it really takes away some of the bad feelings of getting mana screwed or mana flooded because it really accounts for both in one card. And we've got a bunch of these in the set. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think they're one of the best limited mechanics. I almost wish, I mean, they're, they're too good for 60 card formats. I mean, that's sort of been proven. A bunch of them have been abused in a variety of different ways because of, you know, which side of the card counts as a land, which side doesn't. All sorts of stuff like that has come up in 60 card formats, but I wish these were just always in limited, like that you could draft three or four of these in every limited format because games would just be better. There'd be fewer games that are a result of bad luck. I mean, you know, variance is still a thing. We can't take it out of the game entirely, but having a bunch of common or uncommon modal double-faced cards that are lands on one side and spells on the other, that's pretty sweet. And so I think this will probably help make the format, you know, not have as many um, rough moments where you're just cursing at your bad luck for how you're drawing and stuff like that. So another big theme in the set in general is Eldrazi. They are back in a big way in this particular set. Um, and there are a couple of different mechanics related to them. If we look at Breaker of Creation here, it costs six generic, and then those other two symbols are colorless mana. So, you know, this is why we say generic now. We used to say six colorless all the time, 
but that's not what it is anymore. And this is a thing that also changed in a Zendikar set, uh, Battle for Zendikar block, uh, where we first saw Wastes, which is a basic land without a basic land type uh, that can tap for colorless. And what those symbols mean is you have to produce mana using sources that produce colorless mana specifically, like Wastes, but also including various lands in the set, um, including the Eldrazi um, drones who can sacrifice for colorless. Basically, you know, if you go back and look at old magic cards today in the Oracle, like if you look at Soul Ring, it taps for two colorless now. So that would pay for Breaker of Creations two colorless here, for example. And one important thing for Limited to keep in mind here is you have to draft wastes. They're not like other basic lands that you just get infinite if you want them. You have to draft them. It's like snow lands and things like that. So, you know, drafting a waste here or there is a good idea. The ideal thing, you know, because wastes aren't great for your mana base, obviously, because they only produce colorless mana. The ideal thing is to uh, have sources, have other lands that can tap for colored mana as well as colorless. You know, I'm sure there's going to be a filter land in the set that does that that'll work out well. Or using the Eldrazi um, drone tokens. Like, you don't want too many wastes in your deck because your deck's not just going to be a colorless one. And that's what makes a card like this harder to cast than it looks at first because double colorless is big. Like, one, you know, that's not that big of a hoop to jump through. Two, two colorless, that's kind of a big jump. Um, the good news is it costs eight, so theoretically you'll have the mana you need by the time you get there. It is a pretty sweet card if you can cast it. It has hexproof from each color, so more or less removal doesn't work on this particular creature. And when you cast it, you're gonna gain a bunch of life because all your lands are colorless. So this is a nice payoff for ramping because it'll help you stabilize by gaining you a ton of life and then playing a huge unkillable creature you know, outside of combat anyway, that can then annihilate a couple of permanents. And Annihilator's back too, by the way. I guess I could talk about that as well. I did basically just explain it, but yeah, a card has Annihilator X, and then X is a numerical value, and win a card with Annihilator, which are always Eldrazi, unless that might change in this set, who knows? But they tend to be Eldrazi, and your opponent has to sack a number of permanents equal to that, which in this case is two. So, you know, the, the, the upside here is you gain a bunch of life and play a huge creature. Um, Annihilator 2 is not likely to be super powerful at that stage of the game, but if your opponent doesn't kill it after it swings once, they're in trouble. So, you know, you can also reanimate this, stuff like that. I mean, this card looks like it will be, especially being an uncommon, like, kind of a legit win condition, or at least card that, if it doesn't win you the game um, in a literal sense, it basically, you know, it gains you seven life and you get a huge creature and your opponent can never come back from that. All right, so next let's look at Devoid, another Eldrazi mechanic. Our example here is Writhing Chrysalis, and this card also gives me an opportunity to talk about one cool thing they did in this set, and they do it a lot in these sort of um, not typical release sets, these supplemental sets, um, and that is that there are signpost commons in this set along with uncommons, so synergy is probably going to be pretty big in the set, and Writhing Chrysalis tells us more or less that Red Green is an Eldrazi ramp deck. So if you're going to play that big 8-4 we just looked at, this might be the best deck for it. And, you know, the thing about Writhing Chrysalis, though, that uh, I want to talk about mechanically is that it has Devoid. So this is something that originally we saw in Battle for Zendikar block, and it means that even though this card costs colored mana, it's colorless. So it helps you pay off all the colorless things you can play, including, you know, that 8-4. It'll be able to gain you life from that. And there's a bunch of other colorless payoffs in the set, too, because Eldrazi are such a big factor. And Writhing Chrysalis overall looks like a really, like, this could be a signpost uncommon in a particular set, and it would be great at common, getting a 4-mana 2-3 that makes a makes two, <laughs> I actually thought it only made one for a second, it actually makes two zero one one Eldrazi spawn tokens, which is, that's really insane. Um, and then you can sack them for mana. And then when you sack other Eldrazi, it gets counters. Like this card is crazy push for a common. I mean, the worst case scenario is that you basically turn it into a four mana, four or five, right? <laughs> so, cause you can just sack the tokens right away. But yeah, so this will help you ramp into big Eldrazi. It'll give you colorless mana sources, and then it's a payoff for sacking those scions or uh, drones. or spawns, actually. I said drones earlier. Spawns, Eldrazi spawn tokens. Um, so yeah, um, Devoid matters because colorless matters in this set more than it does in basically any set. 
Next, we've got energy returning, and this is a big theme. I know this because it's on another signpost common that we've already seen, Conduit Goblin, which enters and makes two energy. So these are counters that you get. So they're like poison, except they're not a bad thing to have on you. So these are counters that you get to see how much energy you've got. And then you can generally spend them on things. So you're gonna have some cards in the set that all they do is gain you energy, or I mean, they're like a, a creature that gains you energy when it enters the battlefield. Um, and that has some real value in a set where I think there are several energy-based archetypes. I think blue-red, for example, is gonna be an energy deck too. Um, it's less clear about the others as of when I'm recording this, but I think there's gonna be at least three energy archetypes in the set. And uh, yeah, so just making energy, a two mana two two like this that makes you two energy matters because you have things to spend the energy on. But in this case, you also can spend that energy using the Conduit Goblin. It can, at the beginning of combat, you can, you can use one of those energy tokens and then, or counters, and then um, you give something plus one plus zero in haste. Can't give it to itself, that would be particularly insane, although given the signpost common we just saw, you know, that would be comparable, I think, but it can't quite, it's not quite that good, but it gives you energy. That itself, you know, when we saw energy the first time around um, in um, Kaladesh, it, getting two energy wasn't worth like a whole card, but, you know, I don't know, like two energy is probably in a really synergistic energy deck worth like at least a third of a card. So, you're coming out pretty far ahead already, and then this can this can spend that mana on uh, that energy on an effect. And I think most cards generally that make energy can also use the energy, and that's really great. But like I said, there are some cards that will just give you energy, which is also fine, but not as good as a card that is an enabler and a payoff. So energy is back in a pretty big way, I think, just like the Eldrazi are. So the last of these mechanics, it looks like it's going to be a pretty big theme, is Adapt, which we've already seen on two commons. Uh, Basking Brood Scale, another Devoid Eldrazi, and Evolution Witness. Um, and Adapt is a mechanic we saw originally in one of the Ravnica sets. It was a Simic mechanic. And you pay an amount of mana, and if that creature doesn't have a counter, a plus one plus one counter on it, it gets a number of counters equal to the Adapt value. The Brood Scale gets one counter. The Witness gets two counters. Um, and you can see that both of these also pay off for, for doing it, which is pretty strong. You know, the Brood Scale cranks out one of those Eldrazi spawn, and Evolution Witness has the Eternal Witness trigger. You know, that's what the card is referencing uh, when it gets counters placed on it. And the cool thing about both of these is that neither of them only count Adapt, but they work with Adapt. And they both look like really good comments to me, especially the Witness. Um, and it's not ultra clear, but I think there is a theme. Obviously, in green, there's a theme of Adapt and plus and plus one counters, and, you know, maybe blue-green's about that. But there's also, they made a big deal about Modify being back in the set in the uh, intro video. So far, we've only seen like a rare that cares about it, but it makes me think that that mechanic in general, which likes or, you know, a modified creature is one that has any counters of any kind on it or any auras on it or any equipment on it. So, you know, all any of those things count as a modified creature, basically the things that enhance your creatures. So these might even have extra value on top of just being able to adapt. It is worth remembering that you can do this at instant speed too. Um, a lot of these adapt, a lot of effects that put counters on something like these days are not, uh, they're only sorcery speed. Uh, not here, you know. The set has, as you can see, you know, it has a higher power level than your typical limited set, especially at common, because it's one of these supplemental sets. And uh, yeah, so, you know, you can attack with these and threaten to activate them, uh, which is just nasty. So Adapt is strong. All these mechanics can be really strong. You know, you do really need a critical mass of energy um, in terms of synergy, energy synergy, um, whereas cards like the Brood Scale and the Witness, I feel like, are just good in their own right. So... You know, they're looking like some pretty darn good green commons here early in preview season. So yeah, those are the mechanics that I think are going to be prominently featured in Modern Horizons 3 based on what we've seen so far. I may have missed one. You know, we may see some other stuff, but, you know, the nature of preview season is, especially at the end of the first week, you never know how much you're going to know or how little you're going to know to some extent. So uh, yeah, we I might have missed a mechanic that'll be more prominent. And maybe I talked about a mechanic that won't be as prominent as I think, but you know, this is an early look at this draft format. Starting this coming week, I'll st start to do my whole set review or we'll have, which I'll do once I have the full picture. 
I do want to talk real quickly about the bonus sheets in this set too. There's basically only one, that's the norm. The last set was a weird one where we had like way too many bonus sheets. In this one, we pretty much only have one and it's a set of cards that are reprints. So there are reprints in this set. They're just all on this bonus sheet and they are all cards that have never been legal in modern, um, like Orem's Chant, for example. Um, so, you know, this bonus sheet will be interesting. A big part of what they're trying to do with it is make cards legal in modern for the first time, and that certainly doesn't mean they'll actually be good for limited. You never really know what you're gonna get with a bonus sheet. I mean, we've seen some that have been sort of epic failures. We've seen some that have been great for formats. Um, I actually wrote an article on, uh, Card Kingdom about what I think makes a good bonus sheet and limited and what makes a bad bonus sheet and limited if you're interested. So I won't go too deep on it here, but I have a feeling that a lot of the cards in this bonus sheet will be either irrelevant or busted, which <laughs> being on either end of that spectrum is a little dangerous. Um, we also have a special guests bonus sheet. Uh, it is much rarer. You know, the, the main bonus sheet cards all appear, one appears in every pack. So you're gonna see them. Uh, the special guests are a set of 10 cards all of which are like modern all-stars, although funnily enough, Fury is banned in modern now. I guess maybe it wasn't when they <laughs> printed it, but Fury's banned in modern. Uh, but the other nine cards are all modern all-stars, and pretty much all of these are pretty good and limited. We already know what this set of 10 will be, unlike the bonus sheet. So yeah, they're gonna be really powerful cards, but they're super, super rare too. Like, you know, if you played, if you played the last couple of sets that had special guest bonus sheets in the draft packs, uh, you, you know, <laughs> you see the special guests ones like maybe once in an entire format, either you get one or your opponent does. Um, so yeah, they're not, they're not a big part of the format, but it is worth noting that they exist. Just a reminder, um, as one of your perks, if you become a patron or a channel member, you will get access to a spreadsheet that'll have all of my grades on it for the format, uh, when the set review is done. So you have this easy to access um, thing to look at um, when you're drafting and stuff like that. So that'll do it for this video. I'm excited to get the set review started. I'm excited about this set in general. Just just the modal double face lands are enough to get me excited about limited formats. So that's going to be pretty fun. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. If you want to make sure you catch future limited content, including a full set review, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.